All right, so today I'm going to be discussing a topic that has uh, been asked for quite a bit and uh, has really made the rounds over the last couple of years with uh, a lot of people expressing interest in this. And I think a couple of uh, high profile individuals have been on shows like Joe Rogan, etc., discussing the pros and cons of what seems to be a in some people's mind, a very extreme diet, but as we're going to see, it's a, it's a little more nuanced, I think, than, uh, than many people realize, and that is the carnivore diet. So, what is the carnivore diet? Well, the carnivore diet is, is actually relatively simple, and I think it's sometimes misunderstood. The idea is you are eating only animals or animal products, um, not plants. Uh, some people say it's a it's a it's an emphasis on reducing plant toxicity in your diet. We'll get into that later. But as you can see, not only does this include you know red meat, beef, beef uh, it includes pork, it also includes chicken, but in particular fish, shellfish, and eggs. Uh, some people incorporate dairy as well, since that's considered to come from an animal. But um, you know there's couple schools of thought on that. It is also important that it include organ meat. So as you can already see, it's a little more variety than I think some people think of. This is not just people pounding steaks. Uh, so it's a simple concept. It's a bit more complex to do correctly. And as you can see in the next bullet, it, ketosis is not the goal. Um, a ketogenic diet can be 65 to 70 percent or more fat. Carnivore diets are often much higher in protein than fat. So protein may be too high for true, uh, true ketosis, but that's not really the point. So why would you do it? Well, there are a lot of claims for it, and what we're going to discuss in this presentation are arguments for carnivore, arguments against it, um, you know, why you would do it in the first place, and, you know, what I really think about uh, its potential utility for people. So what's the truth? Well, let's talk about reasons why you might want to go carnivore or reason why carnivore advocates say you should. One of the first thing that comes up quite a bit is that plants want to kill you. Um, you know, plants don't like to be eaten. Now, this is kind of seen as, you know, one of these, you know, haha, you know, this is a, a great point, nobody's considered. But uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with the concept of anti-nutrients. I've certainly done a presentation on them before. Yes, plants do contain anti-nutrients. Uh, they contain a lot of natural compounds that are basically designed to stop them from getting eaten. I mean, in the most extreme cases, uh, we know of plants that are, you know, poisonous, certainly poisonous to the touch. Uh, a lot of plants that will kill you if you eat them flat out. But even the ones that we tend to enjoy and cultivate have certain compounds in them that are potentially unhealthy. Um, and again, there are things like lectins, uh, phytic acid, which many of us know of, oxalate, which is contained in a lot of, you know, leafy greens, which can cause kidney stones and the like, uh, trip inhibitors, etc., uh, a lot of what these compounds do is they prevent the absorption of or cause the excretion of uh, certain vitamins or minerals. Um, in some cases, they can cause GI upset. You know, all of us are familiar with uh, gluten and, uh, you know, all those other compounds. And in some people cause very, very severe reactions. So, yes, as I said, some are indeed harmful. Now, some are harmful on paper, but also potentially helpful in reality, and this is a very key one to point out. Uh, for example, tannins found in wine, you know, people talk about certain benefits to vasodilation, heart health, etc., while also realizing that tannins actually cause the excretion of other minerals. Um, Sulforaphane, which is one of the compounds in broccoli and a lot of other cruciferous greens, uh, phytoestrogens, which some people consider the devil, you know, obviously you talk about too much soy and the effect on your endocrine system, but uh, there's also some evidence that, you know, a certain amount of phytoestrogens can actually be good for your heart and, you know, good when you get past menopause, etc. Some are helpful, but as you can see, carnivore advocates dismiss them. Um, for example, when we talk about uh, antioxidant phytochemicals, uh, polyphenols, uh, a lot of carnivore advocates will say, well, these compounds don't actually exist in the human body. In other words, these are against uh, normal human biochemistry, and there's not a lot of definitive evidence that these compounds can protect you against disease or protect you against uh, you know, heart disease or cancer or anything else. And they point out correctly that there is not a huge, I want to say, there's, there's a body of research, but it's not all unequivocal that some of these compounds, even the ones that we are encouraged to ingest, um, can definitively reduce the incidence of certain kind of diseases. But the overall argument here seems to be, look, there are so many unidentified compounds, including various, you know, pesticides and the like in plants, that we don't know of them. So if we don't know, it's probably bad. All right, so that's that's an argument. There's a little bit of merit to this one. You know, plants do contain a lot of things that aren't always great for us. So, all right, let's move on. Second argument. 
Um, eating animals and hunting are what made us human, larger brains and bodies. A lot of times uh, these folks will go through the you know, kind of uh, you know, uh, anthropological in data and look through our history and you know show that humans were getting bigger and bigger and larger brains and stronger and everything else when we discovered hunting and you know hunting and fire and everything else and then when we uh, developed agriculture it was seen as a major mistake and suddenly you saw a drop in the size of human beings overall um, their argument there is that agriculture and the replacement of meat for grains actually reduced uh, human beings' uh, brain capacity and physical fitness, uh, bone size and strength, etc., etc. Now, on the surface, this seems to be a good argument, but it's also a relatively simplistic argument. One of the biggest changes with agriculture, of course, is no longer having to actively wander and hunt and migrate, etc. What this meant was that the human population may very well have drifted towards being able to support individuals who are smaller in stature, uh, not necessarily a large and robust, um, since you know, since you didn't have to be quite as durable to uh, to till a field or to you know gather as opposed to hunt, again, it's very very possible that this drift was simply due to a greater percentage of humans who may have been less physically imposing uh, surviving. So there are a lot of reasons, and you know, people also point to the differences in teeth and uh, talking about how introduction of grains led to more tooth decay as opposed to you know with meat and everything else. But again. It's very difficult to rule out the potential that the selection bias was simply due to individuals now surviving who may not have otherwise survived. There are a lot of holes in this theory, but there is no question that nutrients from meat are high in bioavailability, complete proteins, good vitamins and minerals, including some that are not found in particularly high amounts in plant, including B12. There's no argument that meat has advantages, and I don't think there's much doubt that the incorporation of meat into the human diet um, it really allowed for explosive growth uh, as a species. So, you know, a, a little bit of mixed. It's clear that meat is good. It's not clear from this that grains are bad necessarily. Simply too many variables to discuss. All right, third reason. It's healthy. Um, <laughs> this one's a little, a little questionable as well. So a lot of individuals who've been on the carnivore diet and get their blood work done do show an increase in overall cholesterol. Now it shows as their LDL increases, but interestingly enough, in many cases, their HDL also goes up as well. So their cholesterol ratio is still good. Also, what's critical is that LDL cholesterol, not all LDL is the same. There's VLDL, there are different size particles, etc. And uh, there's some evidence as well that when actually doing an analysis of the blood work, uh, individuals on carnivore diets may have high LDL cholesterol, but they tend to be the smaller, quote-unquote, less fluffy particles, uh, which are a little less damaging ostensibly. We'll get into that a bit more later. Also, theories that it raises testosterone, lowers systemic inflammation, in part due to lower glucose and sugar because, you know, glucose is inflammatory, which is true but irrelevant. Uh, better bioavailability of nutrients, uh, as we talked a little bit about, a lot of plant compounds uh, help forcing to excrete nutrients, a lot of that kind of stuff. So most of these arguments are murky. They're based on case studies, and it's based on the assumption as you can see in this last point here, the claims that saturated fat and LDL are heart harmful is based on correlational studies. Now, this is actually a good point. This is something that is still, you know, for a while there, it was very clear that saturated fat and uh, high cholesterol levels were bad and they would kill you and they would cause heart disease. But a lot of studies since then have kind of started controlling for a lot of other things which we now know are bad, metabolic syndrome. You know, we talk about insulin resistance, overall Western diet, and when you start controlling for a lot of those things, it becomes very clear that typically high saturated fat and higher LDL are also associated with a lot of other negative habits and metabolic issues that are well known to be equally bad for you. So is it clear that saturated fat or you know, even unfavorable cholesterol are directly responsible for atherosclerosis and heart disease, etc. No, it's not definitively clear. So, you know, one could make the argument that theoretically there's higher cholesterol levels, even if the ratios are still good, are not necessarily bad. But, um, you know, this is a, this is kind of a question mark and it's a little bit of saying, well, we don't know, so it's probably good, which is sort of the opposite logic of uh, some of the lectin and uh, plant-based so there we go. Now, as far as whether or not it raises testosterone, again, this is completely up in the air as well. There is no direct evidence that it does um, for individuals who are otherwise healthy and normal. Uh, if you are of you know, healthy weight, activity level, and everything else, 
there is not much evidence that if you control for the type of population that would be engaged in you know something as as relatively diet aware as the carnivore diet um, the chances are you're already an individual who is a little bit more savvy as to what they're eating and uh, that you know that's that more or less erases a lot of that uh, correlation all right fourth reason it's easy to follow and you'll feel better. Fairly simple, straightforward guidelines. Okay, well, that seems fair enough, even though, as we said, it's a little more complicated. Reduction in GI stress, bloating, few issues with constipation. This is actually true, and we'll get into a little bit of that later as well. Um, less work to find problem foods. Again, if you're eating a standard diet and you know there are foods that cause you to bloat and this and that and the other, it can often be very, very difficult trying to figure out which food is actually doing it. <laughs> you can spend a lot of time uh, pulling foods out, putting foods back in, and trying to figure out what it is, by more or less restricting yourself to one category of food, you make it relatively easy to just eliminate them all at once. And again, also get to the point where sugar is inflammatory, so without sugar, you'll recover better. So that's kind of a throwaway point, but I keep seeing it repeated. Um, so again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of the challenges with this later. And uh, again, regarding sugar, this is true, but often irrelevant. Yes, Sugar, technically glucose, is inflammatory in that, you know, many issues with sugar processing and sugar absorption is associated with inflammatory reactions, but that's not necessarily bad. It's just part of the process. Uh, we kind of need to get away from the idea that any sort of inflammation is bad. Um, and again, even if certain uh, discrete uh, pro-inflammatory compounds or processes in the body are bad at the time, if the overall impact is a net benefit to the body, then it's not a bad process. So we just need to get out of that mindset. All right. So those are a couple reasons in favor of carnivore from carnivore advocates. Let's talk about a couple reasons not to go carnivore. So the first argument is no fiber. And as you can see, it plays a role in regularity. It's vital for certain gut bacteria. We'll discuss that later. It stabilizes rate of digestion and therefore regulates insulin levels. Of course, this isn't really relevant if there are no starches or carbohydrates. Uh, reduces cholesterol, protects your heart, um, you know, and uh, reduces a case of diverticulosis, diverticulitis. Interestingly enough, uh, in a lot of cases, individuals on the carnivore diet do not experience constipation. For many, it even seems to fix it. Why is that? Well, a lot of meat is relatively low residue to begin with. Um, it's unlikely that you're going to get a lot of, uh, you know, kind of particulate matter uh, going through your gut. Um, it's a little bit of one of those, well, we don't really know why this works so well, but apparently it does. And again, uh, you know, a lot of this really depends on doing true carnivore, taking in enough fats and everything else. Uh, Fiber is, is another one of those things that is far more useful if you're eating food that is in general higher in bulk and residue. So, interesting point as well, diverticulosis, and in fact a lot of, uh, a lot of GI issues, a lot of um, structural issues with the, with the intestines can actually be exacerbated by high amounts of fiber. But, you know, again, that's still something under investigation. So, no fiber. The one thing that it's going to be potentially important to is in discussing gut bacteria, which we'll get to in a bit. Second argument, it will wreck your gut microbiome. This is actually true in some ways. I mean, there are certain beneficial bacteria that need fiber and resistant starch. You know, the production of butyrate and a few others requires resistant starch. Um, that's an extremely uh, beneficial compound. Uh, fermentable fiber promotes growth of some bacteria that compete with harmful ones. This is very, very true. Uh, there are a lot of those bacteria that produce, you know, kind of putrefactive compounds. Uh, there are certain bacteria that are fed by fiber and uh, certain resistant starches that produce, for example, lactic acid, which reduces the growth of these harmful bacteria. The general thought is, if you're not getting in food for these beneficial ones, then you allow overgrowth of the harmful ones. So that is true, but the issue is, like anything else, we do not know enough about the gut biome. And that's not a cop-out. Um, we don't really have an idea of what a perfect gut biome profile looks like in terms of number of bacteria, this and that and the other, because food types are so different across the world, gut biomes are so unique, and what we take in has such a major, major impact on the diversity. So without really knowing what's an ideal profile, when you typically allow the overgrowth of one type of bacteria, um, you know, for example, let's say you... Uh, let's say a, the bacteria producing lactic acid die out and these putrefactive bacteria start replicating, well, is it possible then that the that particular situation in the gut biome will allow for the proliferation of a different type of bacteria that counteracts this other one? We simply don't know. When you look at Inuit populations, it's very true that they have different gut bacteria. 
For example, they are very low in bacteria that aids in glucose management. Now, some of these individuals, when they then go back to eating a Western diet, or if they do eat a Western diet, will have very major, major issues with glucose management, um, absorption of certain starches, etc., to the point where they are very unhealthy because of it. But again, since they are not eating glucose on a regular basis, it's sort of irrelevant. So we can't really perform an informed analysis and interplay of carnivore biome versus omnivore. So the argument here is we don't know, but it's probably bad, which is something that tends to be coming up quite a bit on both sides. Third argument, red meat causes cancer and heart disease. Well, as we pointed out, a lot of these studies are correlative. Um, is it possible? Yes. One of the things that we certainly do know is that, you know, grilling meat, obviously, and, you know, cer certainly overcooking meat, uh, having a lot of burned uh, surfaces on the outside of meat can, it contains a lot of carcinogens, so that is something to absolutely be aware of. Uh, cholesterol profiles, etc. But again, as we mentioned before, uh, there's still a question mark as to whether or not the saturated fat and high LDL leads to heart disease, again, in the absence of metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, etc. Possible, close to probable, not definitive. This is a much, much larger topic than I can get into here. But uh, suffice it to say that, yes, you know, generally low LDL cholesterol is seen as a good thing. Uh, but again, until we definitively know, we can't say for a fact that too much saturated fat or unfavorable, what we believe to be unfavorable cholesterol profiles here is definitively linked to heart disease. It's, again, it's a question mark. Do with that what you will, and I'll give my final recommendation at the end. Fourth argument, nutrient deficiencies. Um, for example, you know, everyone talks about, well, scurvy among sailors from just eating meat and not having access to fruits, no vitamin C, thiamine, etc., what is very interesting to note is that a lot of these compounds, um, for example, uh, you know, thiamine, for example, have, play a role in glucose metabolism. Um, vitamin C, for example, um, you know, in, in cases of hyperglycemia, is outcompeted by glucose. You are less likely to be able to absorb vitamin C if you have a lot of glucose in your diet, etc. Vitamin C requirements are actually significantly lower if you are not taking in any carbohydrates whatsoever, not to mention the fact that eating organ meat and connective tissue also contains a lot of uh, a lot of uh, sorry a lot of collagen. Uh, vitamin C is actually crucial for changing a configuration of one of the amino acids associated in collagen production. If you are taking in that amino acid directly via collagen, you need less vitamin C. So even though it seems to be that there are some deficiencies, uh, some vitamin and mineral deficiencies on the carnivore diet, it does appear that simply the fact that you are not eating starches or really much glucose at all reduces the need for vitamins. Of course, the question here is, what is the appropriate vitamin and mineral profile for someone on a carnivore diet? We really don't know. You know we're constantly going over recommended daily allowances and recommended daily intakes of vitamins and minerals for somebody on a, a varied Western diet, uh, but we haven't really done that for the carnivore diet. So it seems a little, yes, it, it may very well be okay, but again, with no longitudinal studies being done, it's still probably worth supplementing if you're on it because there are chance that it, you know, there are nutrient deficiencies. The carnivore diet does also allow for fish and shellfish. This is very important. I think a lot of people just start, you know, picking up slabs of meat and pork and realizing that that's, or thinking that that's the way to go and uh, not realizing that bringing in a lot of fish is, is pretty crucial, especially for your, uh, you know, omega acids, omega fatty acids. Grass-fed beef does not really contain enough, so you know, despite what the claims may be on grass-fed or grass-finished beef, you're not getting a significant amount from that. Another one, fifth argument, terrible for the environment. Okay, yes, animal meat, high carbon footprint, factory farms, harmful to animals in the environment. Everyone went carnivore, we'd be screwed. That is absolutely correct. I can't find a single flaw in this argument whatsoever. Yes, if we somehow revamped our entire food distribution system to be locally sourced ethical farms and you know, repurposed all our existing land and redistributed our population in such a way that we could have sustainable, ethical animal agriculture, something tells me that we'd be fine in a few Western countries or you know, maybe in certain parts of the U.S., but population density is simply too high, especially globally. So being able to say, yes, you know, I, I eat all my grass-fed beef and this and that and the other is very much an absolute privilege. And I think if everybody decided to go the carnivore direction, we'd all be in major, major trouble. 
we would need a complete overhaul of our entire factory farming system really to make this sustainable. Again, possible, but unlikely, especially given the fact that our population is growing, that urban centers are growing, though thanks to COVID, potentially a little bit less. And uh, we simply don't want to start just, you know, chopping down trees and repurposing a lot of existing land uh, just so we can throw some cows on it. So that's a very good argument. Anyway, What's the reality? Well, case studies are few and far between. We do have case studies of Inuit populations, and we think we know what Inuit populations eat, but what's critical to note here as well is that a lot of Inuit populations, which are typically thought of as having carnivore-type diets, their diet has changed drastically since pff, probably the 1900s. So, you know, we're, we're at the point where we're at least 60 plus years removed from actually being able to look at gut microbiomes or, you know, health impact or, you know, overall all cause, all cause mortality of these populations eating a true carnivore type diet. Uh, so we really can't extrapolate any data from these populations anymore. And in fact, some of the earlier studies showing that they had lower incidence of heart disease, et cetera, et cetera, were all flawed. Um, so we can't really take too much of that into account. All we have, therefore, are you know isolated YouTube personalities and anecdotal reports from people saying, yeah, blood work is great, but of course their blood work is potentially cherry-picked and we don't have a lot of long-term data. Uh, you know, we're seeing people who've done carnivore for two years and they feel just fine. Well, that's, that's all well and good, but uh, we live for a lot more than two years or five years or 10 years or 20 years in many cases. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's not really great data. So is it harmful? Potentially, yes, there are still question marks around the microbiome, around cholesterol and heart disease. Uh, there are no compelling reasons to think that any of these are not a concern. There's a lot of hand-waving and saying, well, you know, it's probably just fine and we're adaptable and this and that and the other, and there's no definitive link between cholesterol and all that and heart disease, but it can't be ruled out. We don't have enough data to dismiss it either. Is it helpful? Yes, potentially. Um, think of it as a severe elimination diet. Again, many allergies, GI issues are caused by plants, so certain types of plants, categories of plants. And, you know, don't worry too much about anti-nutrients, uh, you know, unless you have ex existing issues like, uh, for example, kidney stones, etc. As long as you eat a varied diet, um, you know, it's, it, it's not the kind of thing when, you know, you're you should really be horribly worried about excessive amounts of, uh, you know, phytic acid and the like. But again, food allergies and tolerances are not uncommon. So if you if you have a feeling that you have those, then you regularly experience bloating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Rather than doing a piece by piece elimination diet, you may actually find some value in using the carnivore diet for a brief period of time. And I'll get into kind of what I would recommend there. What can I ignore? Okay, claims to improve performance, higher testosterone, healthier heart. There's no more evidence for this than against it. Just, just ignore all that. Yes, you have people who do well on it, but there's no evidence that it's any better. Also, ignore the claims that this is how we are meant to eat. Humans are adaptable. Agriculture is needed. It was crucial. Um, the you know introduction of a wide variety of food sources. The fact that the highest performing athletes and the like all incorporate you know starches and foods with glucose. Um, you know that's. It's not how we're meant to eat any more than we were meant to be vegetarians or vegans. Humans are, by definition, we are obligate omnivores. And yes, we are adaptable. And yes, over the course of multiple generations, we can adapt to certain dietary sources. But our, our extractions at this point, our ethnic extractions are so varied that we can't claim really to have any particular DNA bent specifically towards one more way than another, despite what 23andMe will say. So how would I recommend it? Well, it could be useful as the first phase of an elimination diet. You would probably ideally run it for two to three months. Um, there is a break-in period. You may feel terrible for the first month or two. And use that with a slow reintroduction of uh, you know vegetables and uh, plant sources and, and grains and starches. But there are a couple major caveats. You must do it properly. Incorporate fish, incorporate organ meat, connective tissue, eggs. Avoid overcooking meat. Um, overcooking meat can actually destroy some of the things like the small amounts of vitamin C located in meat and the like. Um, remember, it was the eating of dried beef only that caused a lot of issues with uh, a lot of sailors and scurvy. Now, I would also say only do this if you are an individual who gets regular blood work done. If you're the kind of person who dodges your physicals and never gets blood work done and would rather just not know, I would not recommend this. This is a dramatic change to your physiology. And frankly, if you're having the, the GI and performance issues 
that are that would require you to adopt something like this, then you should need to be getting some damn blood work done anyway. Um, that's step one. So yes, if you have regular blood work done, you're a candidate for this, and you have access to high quality meat. What does high quality meat mean? Well, you know, in many cases, some may say ethical farming practices, grass fed, grass finished beef, et cetera, et cetera. But um, don't don't think about doing this if you're you know you're you're shopping your supermarket is you know one of these food deserts where you've got access to you know high fat cheap ground beef and that's about it and fried chicken that's really not the way to go so it's not a miracle cure the reason why so many people feel great on it is likely to to unaddressed intolerances with certain grains certain fibers certain starches that is why I would almost definitively say some people when they start this diet say, oh my God, I feel fantastic. This doesn't mean I say it's something you should do for the rest of your life. This is a great way to address those intolerances, but continuing to stay on the carnivore diet, I think at that point is, I can't endorse it. It honestly seems convenient, but a little bit lazy and like it's dodging the true issue, which is finding the source of these intolerances and trying to reincorporate certain foods that, uh, you know, that, that don't set you off. So find intolerances, reincorporate as needed, reintroduce slowly. When you start reintroducing these foods, is, again, begin supplementing with a multivitamin or whatever you choose, um, you know, alternate sources of vitamin C, etc. When reintroducing grains, again, because certain fibers increase extraction or excretion, etc., Honestly, the best thing to do is just eat a reasonable diet, and if you're having GI issues, do an elimination diet, but there you have it. Basically, it is not as dangerous or as crazy as some people claim. It is not a miracle cure like some people claim, so more or less exactly what you probably expected when listening to this. Is it something you should try? No. Can you probably safely try it for a couple months? Sure. Like anything else, just take necessary precautions and don't believe the hype on either side. I hope this was useful to some, and uh, I'm signing off.